Hello and welcome to Bio Lessons to Go. I'm Mr. Dove, and this is Discovering the Nature of Our Genes. Today we know that our genetic blueprint is contained in long strands of DNA that's found inside of our cells. But this wasn't always the case. DNA was first isolated in 1868 by a scientist by the name of Frederick Miescher. Miescher, a Swiss scientist, was interested in studying the chemistry of cells, and he chose to study white blood cells. White blood cells are found in great quantities in pus, as they are a part of our immune system, and they are sent um, to sites of infection to be able to fight off that infection. He obtained a lot of rags um, from uh, infection sites, and he washed the rags so that he could get access to the cells. He then um, broke down the cell membranes and the nucleus and isolated the substance inside the nucleus. The substance he called nuclein because it was found in the nucleus. And we now know that the substance that he discovered was DNA. By 1902, scientists had pretty much figured out that chromosomes were responsible for um, being passed from parent to offspring and carrying that hereditary material. But because chromosomes are made up of both protein and DNA, there was some question as to which of those two molecules were responsible for our heredity. When we look at the building blocks, there are 20 building blocks. There's 20 amino acids to produce the various proteins. While DNA only has four building blocks, um, four nucleotides to build up our DNA strand. So scientists thought that DNA was just way too simple to be our genetic material and their money was placed on proteins being our source of genetic material. In 1928, we made some headway um, in uncovering whether or not it was DNA or proteins that was our genetic material. This was uh, done as a result of work of a British bacteriologist by the name of Frederick Griffith. Griffith basically discovered that there was some chemical that was responsible for passing on hereditary material. Um, and he learned this by working with um, a bacteria called Streptococcus pneumoniae. Now there are two strains, two varieties of Streptococcus. There's a rough strain, which we call the R strain, and there's an S strain, also known as the smooth strain. The rough strain, um, when it grows colonies, it appears jagged and rough. The rough strain does not have a protective coat, and for this reason, um, it is non-virulent. It cannot make an organism sick. Our immune system is able to attack it and destroy the rough strain. The smooth strain, when it forms colonies, the colonies appear smooth, and they do have this protective coat, which protects it from an immune system. And so this uh, protein coat allows for it to be virulent and to actually cause a disease and make you sick. In Griffith's experiment, he started off with a basic control. He took his rough strain and he injected that into a mouse, and the mouse lived. Which makes sense because it, we can conclude that the rough strain is benign. It's not going to make you sick because it doesn't have that special coat. Um, the mouse's immune system was able to overcome that bacteria and he was able to recover. For his second control, um, he took his smooth strain, which he knows uh, makes individuals sick, and he injects that into a mouse, and it dies. This proves that, yes, indeed, the smooth strain is virulent. Because it has that protective coat, um, it is responsible for causing a disease that the mouse can't um, overcome, and it passes away. Now, he was able, then, to use heat to be able to kill the smooth strain, and he wanted to see if perhaps this could be efficacious in creating a vaccine. So he injects this into the mouse, and it lives. This proves that by using heat, um, we can make that smooth strain um, unable to survive, and so the mouse is able to mount an offense using its immune system, and it lives. So he wondered, what would happen if we mixed 
the rough strain that doesn't hurt the mouse with the heat killed smooth that also doesn't hurt the mouse. Well, he injects that into the mouse and it dies. He's like, what's going on here? Well, he uh, takes some blood sample from the mouse and he looks under the microscope and he finds living smooth. And so he's trying to figure out an explanation as to why um, there's now live smooth because no live smooth was injected into the mouse. He concluded that there was something present inside of that living smooth that was able to instruct the formation of a coat, a protective coat. And that stuff was able to be transferred into that living rough bacteria and allow it to be transformed into a live smooth. So he called this material a transforming factor. Today we know that transforming factor is most likely DNA. He was unsure of that at this time, um, so that's why they would call that the transforming factor. So based on his observations, he concluded that something had passed from the dead S and transformed the living R into live S. And so we call he, this transforming factor must be the genetic material because it could be inherited in the next generation. So what was it? Was it protein or DNA? To answer that question, um, in 1944, uh, Avery McLeod and McCarty, um, three scientists, actually repeated Griffith's experiment with few modifications to be able to figure out what was the transforming factor. Basically, what they did is they isolated those things that could be responsible for um, transformation, the DNA, the protein, and they used enzymes to destroy those factors. So in one setup, they used an enzyme to destroy the proteins, leaving only DNA. When that DNA from the smooth bacteria was put with the rough bacteria, they then injected that material into the mouse. And lo and behold, there was transformation. When the DNA was destroyed with an enzyme, leaving only the protein, there was no transformation. And so we only ended up with rough bacteria, which wouldn't hurt the mouse at all. So they discovered that without DNA, when DNA is destroyed, you do not have transformation. But when DNA is present, we have transformation. So that more than likely, DNA is the transformation factor. Unfortunately, people were still not convinced. Um, and so it wasn't until 1952 when two other scientists, Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase, performed a definitive experiment to prove that DNA is indeed the transforming factor. Um, basically, in order to prove this, they used a special kind of a virus called a bacteriophage. And so a bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria. And this is a picture of a bacteriophage. Bacteriophages, basically, they have a DNA, a genetic material, that's um, surrounded by a protein coat. So here we've got um, an electron micrograph that's been colored so that we can see um, a bacteriophage in action. And so when a bacteriophage works, it lands on the surface of our bacteria and it's going to inject its genetic material, which we know is DNA. So the DNA is inside of our uh, protein coat that's on the outside. What happens when that genetic material is inserted into the host, that viral genetic material, the viral DNA, will instruct the host to begin to produce new viruses. As those viruses are produced, um, in order for them to be released, the cell is destroyed, it lyses, it breaks open, and then the new viral particles are released. So Hershey and Chase knew that whatever the virus was injecting into its host is going to be the genetic material. So what they did is they labeled 
uh, some bacteriophages um, on the surface of their protein coat with radioactive sulfur because sulfur is found in proteins but not DNA. They labeled the DNA of bacteriophages with phosphorus that was radioactive because DNA has phosphorus in those phosphate groups that make up the backbone of DNA, um, but protein doesn't have phosphorus. They then allowed our viruses to infect the bacteria. So the viruses are going to inject their genetic material into the host. Now, what we'll need to do then is separate what is on the outside from what's on the inside. And they basically used an agitator device, very much like a blender, to separate the viruses from the bacteria, what was on the outside from what was on the inside. They then analyzed the material. Um, the stuff that was on the outside was our radioactive sulfur, which tells us that the protein that made up the protein coat remained on the outside. What was inside of our bacteria was actually the radioactive phosphorus, telling us that our viruses injected DNA into the host. And so because the DNA went inside the host, then DNA is the genetic material. So while the chemical nature of heredity was discovered to be DNA, there were still a lot of questions to be answered. Like, how does e DNA work? How is it storing information? How does it copy itself so easily? So these questions will be answered as we look further at DNA and DNA structure.